Well, hello and welcome to the Play Healing Podcast with me, your host, Debbie John. And today I've got the delight of introducing you to Michael Allison. And we met at the Master Series, didn't we, in Oxford University at this trauma conference with all these incredible people like Bessel van der Kolk, Stephen Porges, um, Levine, Peter uh, Levine, Peter mm-hmm. Levine um, Deb Downer, all of these people. And, and yet you were also there. And mm. to be honest, your workshop with Maddie Shisko was mm. a real defining moment, really encouraging moment for me, um, because in the title involved play, talking about the play zone, I thought, oh, this is interesting, polyvagal theory and play, because I've been sort of weaving my own links with polyvagal theory and going on a journey. And I thought, wow, I've I've not come across this guy before. And we we just we had, you did it you delivered a fantastic workshop and then afterwards we had a couple of conversations again and felt like we we really connected over um, this area so I just wanted to bring you onto the podcast and uh, give you the platform and let's let's uh, see if we can inspire people in in the link between polyvagal theory and the power of play. Have I have I got that right? Could you introduce what where you've got to now? Um, and if you want to, I'd love to hear how you played as a child first, because I always ask my how I played as a child. Yes, that's that's a great question. I've never been asked that question. So, yes, we did meet in Oxford, and it was a lovely meeting, and we absolutely shared a connection around play and the power of play when it comes to healing and. What was really different about that conference, and I think what may have really resonated with you, is we can actually heal through play as well. It doesn't have to be so heavy all of the time, right? And so that was, I think, why we were there, why Maddie and I were there, was to really have a uh, have a different spin on polyvagal theory and also a different approach to healing. And play can be that, right? We can meet a body that, for whatever reason doesn't trust that it's safe to be still and instead is more in a mobilized defensive state. And we can meet it through trusting relationships and social engagement back and forth and turn that into play, whether it's dance, whether it's playing sports, whether it's playing in a band together, or whether it's even just having a conversation, which is what this can be too. It can be playful. It can be spontaneous and reciprocal and and see where it goes, which is to me what play is. Uh, how did I play as a child? Well, I grew up in in the east of, of the U.S., so in Pennsylvania, actually, and in a real rural area. So I grew up in the woods. And our neighbors, really, it was farmland around us. We weren't farmers, but we had a lot of land, and it was very rural. Uh, and so I played in the woods. Really? And at the same time known. look at my background oh i know it's beautiful <laughs> no i played in the woods so that resonates really you must have known intuitively and so i did a lot of playing in the woods which the way i'm defining play now and i think the way we're going to talk about play isn't necessarily play because the way we're looking at play is play with relationships and it's interactive so i played in the woods but i was really playing with my brothers. I had two brothers, so we would be playing together often in the woods so that did have that co-regulatory experience. We would do a lot of climbing of trees and there were vines that we could cut and then swing on. And that's what we did with our friends who would come over. We would play a lot of games outside with our friends, whether it was sports. I grew up playing a lot of sports, um, Mm -hmm. whether it was basketball or baseball or football, the kind of classic American sports. And so it was a lot of physical activity, Mm -hmm. but I would say the most at home that I was with play was in the woods and with, and particularly with white, I loved white tailed deer. I loved to sort of track deer and really kind of just meander through the woods and, and all of that, but often with others, we were doing it together. So it still would fall under the way we're looking at play. Wow. So there's that level of excitement and anticipation and yes, journeying. Yes. And, and, and you don't know. There might, nothing might uncertainty. show. Uncertainty. And there might. Yeah, there's all of that, and which is part of play, 
right? Yeah. It's grounded in enough safety and enough of, okay, I'm okay. But then there's those flickers of disruptions, you know, like ruptures or violations of expectancy, things that are uncertain and unknown, but not so much that it throws you into being afraid and running away or whatever, but usually that's contained by another who's cueing you. Mm. Like, oh, it's actually okay. We're, we're good. We're, on, we're, we're okay. <laughs> and that curiosity and discovery then translates when you're an adult, when you're in a relationship with someone and you can continue those kinds of veins, can't you? And Absolutely. Very, very cool. That's what sparks desire. And yeah, yeah. Ooh, very exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about your parents or parents or carers, whoever you grew up with? Um, how did they create that environment for play so that you could you know, go into the woods and stuff? Was it the fact that they just gave you the time and the freedom? Were there any other elements to the way you were parented that you think aided your your creativity and discovery and built confidence, those kind of things? Well, they certainly gave us the freedom because of where we live. There there was no, I mean, there there were no locks. I mean, we never locked our doors. We We would leave and basically play with friends or with each other as siblings and in the woods all day, whether it was snowing outside in the winter or whether it was in the summer and we'd go out and collect lightning bugs. You know what lightning bugs are? Little fireflies, they, yeah. they blink. Yeah, yeah, so you collect those in a little jar and put little holes in them and put them in your bedroom as a night light and they'd flicker. So we had lots of freedom as far as being able to be exploratory and adventurous, no doubt about it. We would make trails through the woods and we we had all of that freedom. So I'd say they provided us with that freedom, whether it was deliberate or not. It just, that's how it was. The environment itself was also just conducive to that because we had so much land and we didn't live in a city or even a town. We just had space. So we had a lot of space. And when friends would come over, you would just create different games all kinds of different games, right? Mm -hmm. Kicking the can to, you know, <laughs> hide and go seek, all, all kinds of different games. I can't even remember yeah. all of them, but we had freedom and we had the time and the space. And then my my dad was really athletic as far as he was really into sports. And so growing up, we were, from the time I can remember, I was throwing a baseball, or I was throwing a football and then having brothers, we were always doing that. We even at one point, we had so much land that we made, we made like a baseball diamond. <laughs> on the field, right? like, and it was very makeshift. Like it had like, I think we, for a back, for a backstop, we used our trampoline. We had a trampoline that was huge and it built into the ground, which is play. And then we would flip that up and that would be the backstop. But we had lines and we had bases and we had so... <laughs> It was just the luxury of having permission. that much space in, in farm country, really. Beautiful. So you had the permission to play your way. You had it modeled yeah. to you with your, your dad playing in different ways. You mm -hmm. had the time and space. I mm -hmm. I found... And, and the siblings and brothers. And yeah, and that social interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found that why I set up Play Healing, one of the reasons was that 80% of the adults that I was working with struggled to play right. themselves. Yeah. And when it comes to parenting, often they struggle to play and, and engage with their children. And there's this big disconnect that builds up. Mm -hmm. And that's when this pause piece, piece was, was coming in. I learned about attunement very late in my parenting journey mm -hmm. through doing the, you know, training as a play therapist myself. And I hadn't heard of attachment, attunement. And that radical thought of pausing and tuning into where they were at and this teaching of letting the child lead the way yeah I was brought up in teaching and I was a teacher and I felt like I had to create these these regimented spaces like right we're going to do this now okay children we're going to go outside and then we're going to have a cookie and then we're going to do and I was kind of managing this feeling like oh well I'm the parent so I need to facilitate play and this is how we're going to play today and mm. you f you kind of feel safe in that because you think, yeah, I'm I'm doing the job of a parent. But then I was like, bang, you know, paradigm shift, whatever. Everything was blown out of the water. And I went from teacher to therapist where I'm like, you know, leading the children to following the children. It was a complete shift and took 
all of my <laughs> being to to relearn things that had been quite set in 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 there and I don't know if that resonates with you but it's it's to me it's about con connection and what excited me about your model was it's like you're you're teaching adults how to connect this pause piece but when we pause we we say where where is my body at mm -hmm. like Peter Levine stuff like tuning into that mindfulness piece where am I at where is my nervous system at right now where is my child's nervous system at what do they need from me right now so mm -hmm. take the stage uh, um, I, I don't I think want to go on <laughs> oh well, you're, you're tapping on so many really foundational principles and one being uh, putting aside and whether it's in a therapist client relationship, whether it's in a parent child relationship, whether it's in a spouse partner relationship, uh, that putting aside your agenda and just being a safe and available witness. Mm. And as Steve Porges would say, being accessible which in my language is being open and safe and, and sending cues of I'm here, I get you, yeah. I'm with you. And no more than that. Mm. And putting aside the agenda. And then, then we can follow, right? Then we can follow. And that isn't easy to do. I'm not saying that's easy, but that is as a coach or as the, as the parent in that child parent relationship, I would say that's our primary role is to first just be, enter that relationship as a safe witness, as accessible. And then to recognize when you're getting triggered, when something's happening, or even just being still and silent and feeling like what you were saying, where is that parenting? I'm not sure that's aligned with my parenting model. I'm supposed to be teaching them something. or But that right there is that moment then to meet what I say and what you articulate is meet your body where it is, meet the body where it is. How do you relate to that in a way that might help your body if it's triggered to actually regroup, mm -hmm. to resettle mm -hmm. and to become again, that safe and available and accessible witness without doing anything. And that as well is trying to help parents to know that they don't have to be a clown to be playful. Mm -hmm. that actually facilitating connective play facilitating therapeutic play is actually mm -hmm. sometimes holding space and being calm and mm -hmm. accepting like you say they're smearing all this paint on here and they want to go crazy and you're and instead of going oh no no, no or no, what are you doing <laughs> or going um so, so what are you trying to, to show me or what are you what, what are you doing right now you know you, you don't need to be judged you don't need to work it out and no. even as a therapist when i was when i was being a play therapist i didn't ha i don't need to try and evaluate and digest everything that that child is doing they are processing baby and you just let them process and they know when they finished they know when they finished they'll look they'll look at you right that's it so it's <laughs> like you wait i mean i guess the thing there for me would be that i would do whatever I can. And it's an acronym. Wait, why, why am I still talking? Why am I talking? <laughs> why, why would I, and just wait and wait for them to contact you, wait for them to engage with you, whether it's a look, whether it's something verbal, wait. My wife says that to me a lot. Wait. I and mean, it's our joke in our house, right? Wait, why am I talking? Waste. Why am I still talking? And it's very <laughs> applicable to what you're, to what you're saying. I don't have to say anything. I can wait for them to engage mm -hmm. with me. And that, again, it's not easy as a parent. Um, let's, let's no. right. It's not easy. However, to me, that is a foundation. And, and like you, I didn't discover polyvagal theory, which is really what grounds my, how I move through the world. I didn't discover that when my kids were little, unfortunately. Um, and with my oldest daughter, who's now 23, I definitely looking back, I would have changed a lot in how I was parenting. And I would have, uh, she was very naturally competitive and in wanting to really put herself into teams and things like that, but it was more gauged. I do a lot of exploration between competition and play. And, they're, and often they're in two different physiological states. Like most, when I say competition, 
And the reason when I think you said a lot of people don't feel comfortable playing, and that's because to play, you actually have to be in a safe physiology. There has to be enough safety, enough connection, enoughness, even enough feeling of whatever we're playing in mm -hmm. enough to play this game, whatever it is, right? So there has to be this, and that's a feeling. And mm -hmm. for a lot of us, we're more comfortable competing because competing is grounded more in a physiology that's fighting for something that's yes. they're trying to grab something that you can't have. And that's a different, that's a different physiology, but because a lot of us are in bodies and nervous systems that aren't fully trusting the other mm. more in our own way, more comfortable being on guard competition matches that body better than play. And mm. so we actually have to reconvince, which I know isn't a word, but I like to use it. We need to reconvince our body, our nervous system that actually we can play. We don't have to compete. We don't have to attack. We don't have to defend. We don't have to protect, <laughs> but we can actually play. Mm -hmm. we can. And even when it feels uncomfortable, that's part of the journey is to mm -hmm. be able to just be with that discomfort and see what happens. So lovely. That it reminds me of Brenny Brown saying about to be vulnerable, we need to be courageous. Courage and vulnerability go together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I was talking to someone about being on stage when I was a singer or mm -hmm. doing those kind of things. Sometimes I would be on stage with the band singing. Sometimes I'd be at the back and dancing with my children. And and I was okay with both. And sometimes it's actually harder to to be on stage and be feel exposed than it is just to be in the audience going. I could do better or or just laying back and just being receptive and yet the whole performance narrative you talk about you need this very delicate balance to be able to be standing on stage and be thinking clearly because the amount of people who get stage fright or on the court and they go into too much aggression or they freeze they go into the freeze response let's stay with the stage analogy but um it takes takes practice, doesn't it? I don't always get it wrong. I was saying to you, I'd come into our call quite excited, and very like heightened, and I've had to just kind of bring things down again so I can be present with you, not be thinking about the last conversation I've had or what I've got to do next. And presence is is such a I'm throwing too many things out at once here, but presence mm -hmm. and connection go together as well don't they which is a real core part of being a therapist isn't it and maybe being a therapeutic parent which is what ideally we all probably need to be because our kids are going to go through some stress in their lives right yeah i mean i could go you, you're there was a lot in what you said There's a lot of <laughs> pick out so, what you want <laughs> well the, the, i'll start where you ended which is I reframed my my intention as a parent uh, once I really, really began to embody polyvagal theory and, and how I move through the world from that lens. And I reframed, so if I go back to when my kids were really little, my goal and all of my intention were around keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. It was keeping them safe, right? Of course, I was loving and compassionate and all of that, but it was... Everything was about keeping them safe, which is important, but there's another piece to it that's even more important, and it's helping them to feel safe. Mm. It's a subtle difference, but it's a big difference in the physiology. And so there were parts in my relationship to my children, especially in some of the teenage years when they're starting to experiment with different things where I would have managed that a little differently because I lost sight of really my bigger goal than keeping them safe is that they always feel safe with me, no matter what. Mm. So it shifted into no matter what, no matter what's playing out, no, no matter what, I'm going to regroup in a way that they don't feel that they can't, they're not safe with me, no matter what. And that's the ultimate goal from a parent. 
And part of that is what you're talking about, allowing them to have the freedom to be messy, to make mistakes, to do whatever, and to sort of in a way, it's it's like if you have a dog, dogs are really, really good examples of this, right? Like my dog, when we go on a walk and I take him off leash, he walks with me for a while. And then as he's starting to feel comfortable in that environment, he trots ahead. And he goes off ahead, and then he, but he always looks back. Mm -hmm. and he knows that I'm there. And if I turn around and walk away, he will come running back, right? Because he loses contact. So that's what that's what parenting is. Mm -hmm. Is they know that they are always safe, and they always have that safe place with you. But that gives them the ability, the resilience, to then move away and take some steps on their own, mm -hmm. knowing that they can always run back, just like my dog. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that would have changed uh, had I gone back 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. That that little and it's a big piece, but that would have changed. And then you said something else about now I forget. Freezing, there was freezing on stage and the. Oh, yeah. Freezing on stage. Yeah. And performance. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So in that realm. So I work with a lot of different types of performers. Right. Whether it is a professional baseball pitcher or a high level tennis player or a golfer or a singer, right? Or a performer on stage. And the first part is that recognize and respect that your body, your nervous system is going to have some sort of reflexive reaction to that environment. Period. It's going to, it's going to period as it should, because if we think of it from the nervous system's perspective, you're in a different environment. Maybe you've never been there before, so it's unfamiliar. You certainly don't know all of those nervous systems and bodies that are out there on out there watching. There's no way. And you are interpreting their postures, their movements, their if they're making sound. You're making these subconscious reflexive interpretations, trying to predict what's really going on, right? And you're in a way feeling evaluated because... You are like you just said, sitting back and going, "Oh, I could do better than this." There's there. We know that that's happening out there, and if you're if you're on stage or you're on a court and you're actually playing against someone, now you have competition. You have all of this, and you have anything could happen. There's change. There's there's uncertainty. There's unpredictability, unfamiliarity. All of these cues coming at you. So from the nervous system's primitive perspective, that court, that stage, quite dangerous quite uncertain. So you will have a bodily reaction to that as you should. That's okay. It's now the key is how do you relate to that? Do you relate to it in a way that says, go away, get out of me, stop this, this needs to stop. Or do you relate to it in a way that says, oh, when this happens, uh oh, this means I'm going to forget all my stuff. I'm not going to be a, right. So it's how do you relate to that bodily reaction? in a way that might help you realign that body, that physiology, the way your heart is beating, the way you're creating energy in your body, the muscle tension, the, the ability to use your voice. How do you relate in a way that brings all of that back closer mm -hmm. to what you practice, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the physiological state that supports your intentions or that supports the expression of your skill set, that supports what you know in your head that you want to share all of that. And when it doesn't play out, understanding this and what's really going on and how it's really these primitive networks in the brainstem and in the nervous system, it takes away a little bit of the blame and the shame and the guilt mm -hmm. and the self-criticism. And it gives us a chance to regroup, mm -hmm. which is the same thing that happens in parenting, right? The same thing. Yeah. So like if, if I get really triggered and I lose sight of my own connection in my body and my heart's pounding and I'm breathing out of control and I got a lot of muscle tension. And, and even if I don't say anything, they're picking That's up fine. on it. They're picking up <laughs> on Right. They're picking up oh, on really? it. Oh, really? You just broke and, up with your boyfriend. Okay. Yeah, 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 I really liked him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that happened today at all. But, no, nice. you know. So, so they're picking up on that, and 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 that's part of being human, 
right? Maddie yeah. has a great thing. Her line is showing up human. And that's mm, a beautiful, beautiful line. And, and mm. having compassion for yourself and others for showing up human, which we are. And now can I regroup? Mm -hmm. If I blew it, now when it, can I regroup and repair? Because mm -hmm. it is about repair, isn't it? There is it's this beautiful, repair. thank goodness for the fact that there can be repair. Yeah. And um, But we are responsible for our own emotional response. At the end of the day, I think Dr. Cloud and Henry Townsend, the Boundaries book from years ago, about mm -hmm. we're responsible for our reactions and our response to others. You can't say to someone, you made me angry because... Mm -hmm. Yes, they they did something or they've said something, but we've we've been triggered and and we're responsible for how we respond, whether we lash back out or whether we calm our body as quickly as possible and try yeah. to be adult. Yeah. And uh, as parents, well, one thing is we know with polyvagal theory as well that the people around us pick up on our emotional state. I remember working with very heightened teenagers on the edge of care who at any time could just smack you around the head or grab a pair of scissors and threaten you and it was and you literally had to be so focused on okay where's my breathing at you know yeah. calming I'm I'm alert but I'm going to stay calm and I'm going to play with some clay with them because I know that will ground me probably mm -hmm. ground them a bit too so they don't fly off the handle so quickly or mm -hmm. they've been tearing up the the room and putting loads of graffiti and trying to destroy the inside of this house. So I'm going to get some water balloons and I'm going to let them throw these at me because they're not going to hurt me. And they're going to get be able to do some, something physical and some movement. And they're going to see things exploding and we're going to use play to channel that energy to, in a positive way. So yeah. it's, we pause that was just a you know me pausing thinking okay i'm i can see they're very heightened and angry about the fact that they still have to stay in this house they don't want to how can we use play to 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 keep them going and, and expend that energy so um yeah how would you how could you maybe just expand on the fact that the ch our children pick up on our emotional state and and why that is yeah so let's unpack what you said in in your story there so we we won't stop that initial bodily reaction to seeing something or hearing something that would trigger us. So if we walk into a room and all of a sudden the room itself has paint all over the place, that is completely unexpected, wasn't predicted. And just by seeing that, there will be a shift in our physiology. And what I mean by that is there will be some elevation in heart rate, change in breathing, metabolic output, all of those things. So we, we aren't able to stop that, nor would we want to, because that is our survival mechanisms to let us know that we need to get out, we need to fight, or we need to hunker down and preserve what's left. Like So it's not about stopping that initial bodily reaction. It's about recognizing that which is why I say meet the body where it is. It's about getting more and more, more and more skilled and aware of those subtle shifts and sometimes drastic shifts, but subtle and drastic. There's a range there of what actually shifts in your physiology and then having those resources or strategies or places to put your attention like you were talking about or ways to redirect what is actually in the environment or going on in the environment that you know would actually, it does two things. It's, it's channeling their behavior while it's also taking away that risk and threat and uncertainty that is triggering us as well. So it's doing, it's a twofer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's providing more certainty to you, which allows you to settle in more too, in addition to channeling and containing their chaos with some direction that is, you could say is healthier or mm -hmm. more, more acceptable because damaging stuff isn't acceptable. So you're allowing, you're meeting them where they are, which is mobilized and you're containing it in a way that through that structure, through those boundaries, through that direction, you're moving it towards something that would be more acceptable, which then they might now 
because it also cues you to feel more at ease that now you're sending cues to them that, Hey, we're all good, which then allows them now to start playing too. So yeah, and, it was, and it's reverse power play, wasn't it? That the the throwing water bombs at the people working with them, the you know the people in charge. Oh, sure. It's a power reversal play because they're going, and we're going, oh, oh, you know, it's like you give a, <laughs> yeah. a, a five year old kid who's going through parents divorcing, the the dads just left, and they feel powerless. That yeah. helplessness, that powerless, so sure. so tied in with trauma, Great. right? Yeah. So you give them a pillow, and it's the pillow of power, and every time they hit you with pillow, you oh my goodness, you go completely on the floor. That it doesn't make them suddenly become these children that think they own the place. It just helps them to feel like they, they have, they have some kind of a power on, on, on something because everything else feels like it's, it's not. Well, let's, let's let's unpack that a little more, like from the polyvagal lens. That's a really good example. So if someone has had an experience that we'll call trauma. What Mm -hmm. trauma from the polyvagal lens means that in that event, whatever whatever that body encountered, that body, that nervous system was overwhelmed and went into some version of collapse or shutdown. Could be withdrawal, could be freeze, could be full on passing out, could be dissociation, could be anything like that. But there was some overwhelming response that had some trigger of a shutdown withdrawal. Okay. And then from that moment on, there's a lack of trust in some shape, right? There's the retuning of the nervous system is now retuned to say, I need to be on guard. And and that body might now be mobilized and fidgety and unsettled. That's one response, right? After the event, or another body might stay locked in that withdrawal, just to some version of collapse. And what's actually happening in that body that's in a collapsed in this, technically this dorsal vagal response is the heart rate is slow. The contractility of the heart is reduced. So blood pressure is low. Metabolic output is low. You're not actually calorically expending nearly the amount of energy. You're not making as much energy. You're not expending it because your body is in a state that is all about preserving and conserving what resources are left, okay? So now when you're actually seeing those children collectively, what we might say out of control, but they're physical and they're active, maybe they're angry, maybe they're aggressive. That's the emotion that's emerging out of the physiology. But what we're seeing there is actually a body that's mobilized, which is actually good. Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. they're coming out of that shutting down conserving place. And now they're mobilizing, which that tells me or you, like they have some resilience left in their system. They have some capacity to get going. That's really good. Now all we need to do is actually start taking that mobility that might be now coming out as aggression and anger and rage or whatever And if we can get that mobilized body to start trusting another, Mm. which is what you did, because you're, you're actually that power play from what I'm seeing is like, now you're saying, look, I trust you enough and I'm going to let you throw water balloons at me. And you're like, oh, you're doing all this stuff and you're sending them facial cues that now this is play because I trust you. So their nervous system is- They hear me laughing. They They hear me laughing. Laughter is a very, very good cue. That's right. And so you're now cueing them back and forth that actually you can trust me because I trust you enough that you're throwing stuff at me and I'm laughing. This is fun. And so you're doing this subconscious neuroceptive dance back and forth and you're, you're just containing that. It's not even that you're exhausting that mobilized energy. It's that you're containing it with social cueing that's building trust. That is what play is. And now you're you're actually reconvincing that body mm. that they can trust again. There's that lovely dance there you're talking about, totally. this dance of attunement, right? And it, yeah. it reminds me of another wonderful guy that I worked with. He was very experienced with working with children in care. And that when there was this really quite 
big teenage guy who's much bigger than me and stuff kicking off you know he could have done damage he could have you know I've had 12 year olds throw me over their shoulder at times you know and I could have responded in two ways I could have been put me down and resisted or I could have laughed and I went for the laugh and go ha 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 this is funny and then I'm just thinking I really <laughs> hope they put me down soon because this is not great I'm like supposed to be in charge here but hey uh, but like luckily you know it, it didn't become a thing but yeah when this guy was kicking off going back to the, this story I was saying he would crouch down and go slow and slow and small so it's like you know the threat response he made sure that he didn't come across because he was a strong he he had a black belt you know so he would be fine but it was me going <laughs> you could literally have me right now but mm. i just watched how he did it he went slow low tone actually got down low and was looking up and just gently talking him down and you can mm. see how that again comes into this polyvagal theory oh totally yeah so it there's a lot there too so if someone and you'll see this in sport a lot right okay. you'll see this in uh like where i'll just use an example in tennis mm -hmm. so and this is a this is i'm thinking now of an exact example all right <laughs> so this this coach brought me in um because he really wanted me and this is a high level player and he wanted me to figure out what was going, what what's wrong with this player, basically. That that was this. Come in here. You, you need to figure out what's going on with this player. What's wrong with him? Because in in really big matches that are really really close, eventually he just gives up and he's and they they call it tanking. He just tanks and then he just doesn't listen to anything I say. He doesn't. He just you know, I'm like all right. So so I go and I observe. I'm just kind of sitting way off in the back. No one knows. Even I don't even think the coach knew I was there at this point. And I'm just kind of observing this whole thing. And this player having a tough match, things aren't going his way. And he comes over and he sits down. And uh, and this is this is Division One high level college tennis where a coach can come onto the court, right? Not professional. Professional, they can't come onto the court. So, kid sits down, and the coach walks right up, right up in front of him. Kid's sitting on the bench like this, and the coach is standing directly and directly above him, and he's standing there. And he's, you know, he's like, he wasn't yelling at him or anything, He, but he, but he's standing straight on and he's trying to like say stuff to this kid. Like, come on, man, you got to just try harder, whatever, whatever he's saying. It doesn't even matter. The fact that he's standing straight in front of him, posturally right there, this kid was doing the, what you're saying, the towering maybe, right? He, he was he... just going further and further. Yeah. And so this was going on the whole time until at some point the kid completely gave up as he should because he was overwhelmed Thanks. he's not only things aren't going well on the court but now when he gets when he has his inner in between every two games where he has a chance to regroup he can't because he's got his coach right in his face standing above him telling him what he should be doing and why you know da, 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 and you're so much better than this kid all you got to do is that it's like dude you're just queuing so much more threat and this poor kid is so overwhelmed he believed me, he because he's thinking this kid doesn't care. That's his thing. He's saying he doesn't care. I'm like, dude, he cares so much. All oh, this care. He cares so much. <laughs> he, he, you know, so that's an example of what you're saying, too. So as we're approaching someone who is really in an unsafe body in that moment for whatever reason, we want to come alongside. We want to get down at their level. I tend to sit next to. Right. So like if I'm a coach and I come up to a player who's really suffering and struggling, I'm going to sit next to him and I'm going to give them the cue that we're in this together. It's like, Hey, yeah, we're okay. Yeah. We're, we got this like, or whatever it is, or like, Hey, what's going on for you? Yeah, totally. Get it. Yeah, absolutely. And then we'll do it together and we're going to sit side by side, you know, and, and that's to me what we all what we're all after in this whole quest in our whole journey of life where wherever stage we are we're on this quest of feeling as though i've got my team i've got my mm -hmm. teammates we're right here together Beautiful and mm -hmm. and we've got it and and i belong on this team you belong here with me we all have this felt sense of belonging and that we all know we have each other's back and that if i really i need time to recover and regroup Mm -hmm. you're going to lift me up. You're going to, you're going to take over for me. 
And when I need to be calmed down, you're there to help me calm down and vice versa. And that to me, and expand that out. That's what I mean in life. Like that's what we're after. Yeah. That's our biology is we yeah. want to be part of a team. We want to feel safe, connected in this sense of belonging. And the coach can help provide that or the yeah. parent can help provide that. That's so cool. I was just going to ask you if you could kind of coach the world or get your message out there and, and help us to live in that optimal state, which we call that ventral vagal state. Yeah. Where we can perform, think freely, yeah. build meaning. Yeah, that's what I would call the play zone. That's yeah, what I call zone. the play zone. <laughs> yeah. Like, so if we're living in this play zone, we've got permission to play our way with yeah. living play fueled lives, as I say, you know, what what would the what would be some practical things you could leave listeners with on how to try and bring ourselves down when when we've maybe feeling heightened so i was the anxious mum and i still have to be conscious of when anxiety levels are rising or whether we're in that dorsal uh, shut down state mobilizing ourselves so like a bit of movement or like tapping our bodies you know um, yeah. all those kind of things what could you give us some for the busy working professional yeah. out there? What are the simple things yes. we can do? Well, the first thing is what we've really been talking about, and that's the awareness of where we are, the meeting our own bodies where they are. And now hopefully everyone listening understands that where our body is currently at was not necessarily aligned with our intentions, right? It wasn't that we made these deliberate decisions or conscious choices or intended to be in bodies that in this moment are sending cues to our children or sending cues to the world that I'm warning you to stay away or life is really dangerous, mm -hmm. so I'm protecting myself. We're not, none of us from my perspective intended to be broadcasting unsafety or, or warning to the world. Mm -hmm. We all have really genuine heartfelt intentions. That's what I believe. And the world, for whatever reason, we live in a very challenging world. And we've experienced different things throughout different times of our life that have in one way or another triggered these reflexive patterns in our physiology. And to simplify it, we're just, it's, we're in bodies that just don't necessarily trust that it's safe to feel safe mm -hmm. or to be who we really are and that that's enough to be safe with others and to be accepted and belonging. So the first part is awareness of why we're here where we are without feeling guilt or shame or criticism or blame for ourselves and for each other. That doesn't mean all behaviors are acceptable. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, let's look at what's really going on from this lens so we have an opportunity to stay on our own sides and to have some compassion for self and other because we have to start there. And then we can start applying resources or we can start building strategies or we can start deliberately cultivating lifestyles and environments in which we live and work and play in that we know feed more safety and connection and belonging, right? And that could be, I'll just give one really good takeaway exercise that I like to do, and I do it wherever I go, and I call it the habit of safety. So if I, so when I went into, I think I mentioned, well, maybe I didn't, I did a teacher training last week at a school, right? So I did it an in-service hour and a half with all of the teachers and the headmaster and all of the the people, and they they were having a little meeting before it started that they wanted me to kind of be at. So when they finished, then I could start the, the teacher training. And so when I walked into the room, I don't know anyone, right? So there's 80 people there. I know none of them. I walk around the whole room, like it was in this really cool library and there were different areas. And I kind of walk around the entire place. I'm just kind of getting a sense and a feel and then I, I walk around and I find where I actually feel most kind of settled. I'm just kind of paying attention to what I'm feeling. And of course, I sit kind of in the back corner where there's nothing behind me and it was more of a sofa. So I was just more comfortable when I sat there. And as I sat there, I was really just watching and listening 
and I was allowing my body to sort of settle in. And I was allowing myself to, to sort of see any faces or hear any voices that particularly felt more warm and welcoming to me. And it was really funny because I spotted one person in particular. And so then as I could see that they were wrapping up, I could tell that it was kind of getting near the end and I was going to have to go up onto the stage and do the thing. I, I walked over to this gentleman and I sort of tapped him on the shoulder and I just said, Hey, I'm, I'm Michael. Nice to meet you. And he kind of gave me a little exchange, you know, and then, and then I walked up and uh, at some point, maybe 45 minutes in, someone asked me something and uh, it led to this. And I said, did anyone see what I did when I came in here? And, and two people were like, yeah, you walked all the way around. <laughs> and then like, they, like people noticed. I'm like, yeah, this is really good because you notice, like, that's the point. Like we're always scanning whether we're really recognizing scanning it or not. <laughs> yeah, we're scanning. Well, we're scanning for both. We're scanning for safety and danger. Safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're scanning yeah. for cues that are welcoming and Jesus reassuring. Said. And we're also scanning for what might not be, what could mm. be risky. And so they were like, yeah, you did all this. And then I said, and it was really funny because I, <laughs> and then I said, and I actually, I, I really was looking for a really warm and welcoming face. And I found one and it was this gentleman right over here. And I said, what's your name? And he, because and he goes, oh, I'm Joel. <laughs> and, oh. and then we went on and we did this whole thing. And at the very end of the thing, he comes up to me. And he, goes, he, he had a lot of questions. He was really into it because, you know, I'm the headmaster. And I was like, no. Yeah. Oh, do you know, do, I'm sorry to side note here. Whenever I have I've worked in lots of schools and come across lots of people, most of the time I find that the people who go to the highest leadership roles in schools are the ones who are most regulated for longer periods of time. You might <laughs> find that too. I've got it friends who are headmasters. Just, they are so was, good at being calm. And It was so great. Oh, so, bang on. It was That's so fantastic. clear that I didn't know who this was. That was what was so beautiful too. And I was like, oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Like, it was really funny. And, <laughs> like and you're sucking up to him. I like, got like 80 <laughs> people. Here it is. I picked him out of the whole room so but the point of the story was to get to the resource that i wanted to share yeah and that is what i call the habit of safety and so our nervous system like we just mentioned it's scanning for safety and unsafety or certainty and risk familiarity and unpredictability it's doing both both sides however we can help ourselves and we can we can deliberately look for listen Mm -hmm. and put our attention toward what cues, what features around us, between us, and even inside our own bodies that would be reassuring. Because just like taking the stage, I walked into that room and I got mobilized. I absolutely, I don't know anyone here. I don't know if they're interested at all. This is a mandatory thing. Teacher, and it's near the end of the day. I'm married to a teacher. I know what, I know what, this time of year is like, my wife warns me, she's like, whatever you do, don't make them do anything. <laughs> don't make them do don't anything. Embarrass me. Don't, don't embarrass me. Don't make them do anything. She's not a teacher at that school, but yeah, you know, yeah. Knows, so I know. Get back to her. <laughs> so I know all of this. I'm like going in. I don't know how I'm going to be welcome. I don't know if this is going to oh. be interesting. I have no idea. I love this stuff, but what, mm -hmm. I mean, who not? so I'm a little bit mobilized. I'm I wasn't sorry. overwhelmed and shutting down. I was mobilized. And I did the habit of safety. I did my routine. I walk around. I kind of look around. I, where do I feel most comfortable, mm -hmm. right? So I chose a spot in the room. I found a friendly face. I there. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful room. They had a fireplace, so I was looking at the fireplace, and I was really just uh, really putting my attention to the features that I know reassure me, and that's the habit of safety. And so we can do that wherever we go, wherever we. Go. Oh, wonderful. That's such a really useful, insightful tool that people can take as a kind of yeah. framework and do it their way, can't they? Because someone's play could be someone else's nightmare. Someone, the way someone pauses, someone else could be like, I'm not doing that. You know, going in the cold ice bath for someone could be work really well, for example. So uh, fun times. But I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like I've railroaded that last tool. That was you know, really, really 
lovely and I think I'll definitely think about more like the smells and the sensations I think things like perfume if I put a certain perfume on I can still smell or you know aromatherapy people do it's thinking about what senses we can draw from just to give us that sense of grounding totally. and you know I, I just yeah uh, really really interesting and um, is there anything I was going to ask you the last sort of question about what you would maybe change in the education system and then you, you've said about going into school yeah. so and your oh. wife's a teacher which is yeah. fantastic um, maybe what, what she would want to change would be interesting but have, mm. is there anything from this play perspective that you would like to to see yeah. more of in schools or less yeah at least here in the states I can only speak for what goes on here and I, and like I said I have my wife has been an educator for 25 years. She's currently a teacher librarian and, mm -hmm. and loves what she's able to do now, but she was in the classroom for a long time. And so mm -hmm. the complaint here in the States is they just don't have enough resource, right? So a teacher might have 30 kids. Mm -hmm. That's really, really hard to regulate 30 different nervous systems, including, including your own reactions to those nervous systems. So that, to me, what needs to change first is that and we're doing it little by little in different schools and, and the Polyvagal Institute is doing it little by little in different with different educators in that we just need to first help the teachers understand and to be able to see beneath behaviors at physiology, at nervous system responses to what's going on. And if they can start doing that and then their own reactions, if we can help teachers recognize what we've been talking about this whole time about when they're having a bodily reaction and how to regroup mm. and then see that in their students that's the first step and then the second step is to really have more resources in the classroom so that they can redirect like you're doing with a kid who needs to be moving mm. but to redirect it in a way that's not as disruptive to everything else right and there are some people doing that, right? Like, I'll give you an example. Um, and this is actually from another school psychologist who I was talking with her about this whole thing with the headmaster, and we were just laughing. <laughs> and so we were talking about, about this, and she said, you know what I, and she's works with a lot of schools. She said, one of the things that that has worked as far as redirecting, there was a kid, and this was a true story, there was a kid who was really like being being disruptive, sort of clowning, right? Clowning and clowning is a really interesting state too, because that's, again, you're clowning because you're trying to get social cueing back that you're okay, but you feel really uncomfortable. You feel really unsettled. And so a kid who's clowning is just a kid crying out for some comfort and connection and is actually using their social engagement system but they're doing it in a way that, quote, isn't appropriate for the environment and it's disruptive, right? So this kid was clowning and was kind of telling jokes. And so the teacher recognized that this kid just needs more safety and connection. So what, what she did, which was really awesome, is she talked to the kid and she said, hey, how about you write down all those jokes that you want to tell us? And then at the end of class, you're going to get to perform and do like a five minute thing. And it worked beautifully. It worked beautifully. Very nice. So yeah. Those sorts of things. But that's a teacher who understood that physiological response and what was really going on for this kid and didn't just immediately go, oh, disruptive kid. And what we do naturally is we make up a story as to why they're that way. Oh, parents aren't parenting him at home. Like, whatever. We make up a reason. It's really interesting. This same psychologist asked like sort of laid out a scenario and then asked the teachers why this kid was doing this. And, and every one of the teachers answer was about something not related to them, right? Everything was about, oh, the parents don't discipline. It was like, whatever. It was all about that. There was no actual, well, maybe I might be able to help, right? Or maybe I might be part of this and how might our interaction actually be feeding this or could it nurture this it's just an interesting thing and that's how our brains work right we come up with stories and narratives for what we see playing out or even what we feel playing out and there's a different narrative mm -hmm. there's always there's always a reason 
for for children's yeah. behavior isn't there and we and we don't even need to know it either that's the no. other thing is we don't we don't even necessarily need to know the exact cue or combination of cues that are triggering that physiological response we can still approach it not knowing yes. and still cue safety and connection and still do what you were talking about trying to contain it in a way that becomes play and trust mm. without knowing what's really causing it I love that that's really that's a really important thing for for teachers and professionals to understand if we can get that that message out it's you can actually look at the 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 physical cues and that's mm -hmm. enough sometimes that's enough. that's enough you know it, it gives you enough of a if they're like you know difference between them being all jittery and all their eyes darting around very yeah. different to head down disengaged you know it's oh. it's it's very it's this these kind of yes you get to know more subtle cues but if even if we started with that very we'd go a long way oh, totally. <laughs> yeah i on uh, one final thing with that like the head of the lower school came over when this headmaster came over at the end of the of the presentation and she started describing a particular kid who's very disruptive and clowning and how talent and i was actually reframing it into you know that kid is actually closer to being that kid that's going to be able to learn and be productive in the class and all of that than the kid that's completely withdrawn physiologically Mm -hmm. They might be just, quiet, yeah. but they won't right. be they're, they're They're detached and they're not disruptive. And yeah. so from the standpoint of the rest of the class, yeah, the rest of the class are not disruptive, but that kid's not able to learn and to grow and to communicate and collaborate. And that's, that's, a, that's a slower journey. Mm -hmm. The actual kid that's clowning, they're closer. Mm -hmm. They're closer. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. contained and, and all that. So interesting. Very, very interesting. And it's sparking up a lot of, case studies and stories that I'd love to talk to you about but I think this has been a really lovely taster into what what you do into how polyvagal theory can then permeate our whole lives how play living that play fueled way living in the play zone as you teach is a wonderful state to be aiming for you know and if we can stay in this zone as much as possible we're going to be happier healthier beings able to communicate able to connect able to make the world a better place and ultimately that's what we want right so um really thank you for your work thank you for championing play and thank you for putting it into a model that is understandable and really makes sense to people's performance and the way they live every hour of their lives so thank you so thank you. much thank you that was wonderful that was fun <laughs>